Hey everyone, today we're in Oklahoma City and we're going to look at a particular case that happened years ago. Welcome to War Acres, Oklahoma. It's a friendly little city right in the middle of Oklahoma City. It's grown considerably over the years, but in 1963, it wasn't much more than a sleepy rural bedroom community. Robert Gentry Elston was a 48-year-old prominent businessman in the town. He had dabbled in oil and energy and had become quite successful. In 1963, he owned and operated the National Electric Company in War Acres. By all accounts, he was a normal and friendly man. He was happily married to a Marjorie Elston who was 41 years old and he resided in a nice home. This home was located at 4420 Sterling Drive, which is just one block into the Oklahoma City limits outside of War Acres. Marjorie had one daughter named Melinda Strain, who was 18 and from a previous marriage. Everyone who ever came in contact with the Elstons loved them. Even the police chief of War Acres, Nelson Beckett, was good friends with them. But that friendship would be tested in 1963. On the evening of November 21st, 1963, Marjorie Elston left home with her daughter Melinda and they were never seen again. They were on their way to visit a friend in the city of Nichols Hills and then to stop at the store. Marjorie was last seen wearing a full-length cashmere coat with a mink collar. She and her daughter were wearing about $4,000 worth of jewelry the night of their disappearance. Marjorie also had credit cards and about $70 in cash. The vehicle that they left in was the family's brand new 1963 Cadillac. Marjorie didn't like driving at night, but sometimes she had a habit of going off by herself. At about 10 p.m., her husband Robert became worried when they never came home. Melinda, the daughter, was physically handicapped and was paralyzed on her right side. She had been injured in a car wreck when she was seven or eight years old while her mother was driving in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's why Robert thought it was strange when the two of them never returned from running errands. The mother and daughter were very close and he knew that they would have stayed together. But Robert never called the police that night to report them missing. Instead, he waited until the next morning to call when he arrived at work. Even though he lived in Oklahoma City, he called the War Acres Police Department since he knew the police chief. Plus, he was only one block outside of War Acres and most of the neighborhood that he lived in was inside of War Acres. The police department asked him why he waited so long to report them missing. He immediately responded that his phone was not working. The police department confirmed that the phone was not working and it was further evidenced by the fact that the daughter had used the neighbor's phone earlier that day before their disappearance. In January of that same year, Marjorie's mother had passed away and left behind an inheritance of several hundred thousand dollars. Speculation began to arise that someone murdered the two women. Maybe this was done so that Mr. Elston could collect the life insurance money as well as the inheritance. The police chief, Nelson Beckett, couldn't imagine his friend, Mr. Elston, committing such a crime, but he did start investigating it. Mr. Elston freely took a lie detector test and immediately handed over the keys to his house so that investigators could be sure that he wasn't involved in the disappearance. He was seemingly worried and eager to find answers. Meanwhile, police were searching everywhere for the car as well as any other evidence that might be linked to their disappearance. This was shaping up to be one big story, and it was clear that they were probably going to need some help. The police chief was positive this was going to be a huge news story, and he was looking forward to the help of the media and the community. The only problem was there was another news event that had taken place, and this one was even bigger. News came in that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas. Normally, a story like the Elston disappearance would have probably made national news, but everything in the media was focused on the assassination of Kennedy for days and then weeks. In fact, they never really could get coverage for about three weeks when the case was starting to grow cold. While all that was happening, locals grew concerned and joined in on the search with law officials. Students began searching for clues after school, 
Instead of going to the movies or other types of dates, couples joined in on the search for the mother and the daughter. This became a big case in the community of War Acres as well as the surrounding areas. The local lakes were dragged and searched all around the shores. They searched the woods as well as the city streets and neighborhoods, but they found absolutely no clues or evidence of the disappearance. The following winter hindered the search, but Chief Beckett never gave up. He was determined to find his friend and her daughter. Mr. Elston kept after Beckett to find answers throughout the years. People in the area were really thinking Mr. Elston was responsible for the disappearance. They even talked about him and confronted him to his face with accusations. The War Acres Police Department was receiving tips, but nothing ever turned up. In 1971, Beckett received a lead from a convicted felon. He confessed to the murders of the two women. The confession led the investigators to a river bottom between Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas. When investigators excavated the area, they found bones. However, it was determined that they were buffalo bones and not human remains. Another tip led authorities to a farm well in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. A convicted murderer from Tulsa told police he had stuffed the bodies in there. But nothing was ever found inside the well. They went all over the country trying to solve the case. The police chief followed up with Annie and every tip and lead that came into the station, and they always ended up empty. But then something strange happened. In 1990, Oklahoma City was working on a stretch of highway known as the Hefner Extension near Lake Hefner. They were working on widening the road and there had been heavy rain in recent days at the time. As they dug closer to a little duck pond, the side breached and water flowed out. This little duck pond is one of several overflow ponds around the lake. As the water level to this duck pond lowered, the workers began to notice the top of a car on April 20th, 1990. The workers immediately notified the police department of Oklahoma City since it was located within those city limits. The police had the vehicle pulled out of the pond. They could immediately determine that this was in fact a Cadillac. Not only that, it was the same year and model that Marjorie Elston had. The plates were still on the car, and when they ran them, they determined that this was, in fact, the Elston car, which had been missing for 27 years. So now the question came up as to how they never found the car before. Lake Hefner was a decent-sized lake, and they did drag it, but they never dragged the little pond. It was determined at the time that it was too shallow to hold a car. They had also looked for evidence around the pond and never found any tire tracks, skid marks, or damage that indicated that the car ran off into the water. This was just one pond in a series of ponds located around the lake to help with the overflow of water. They went all around this individual pond, but never in it past what they could see with the naked eye. Over the years, kids would wade and swim in this particular pond, and it was a popular fishing spot. It was never described or thought of as being deep at all. Now that they had the car out of the water, it was covered with fishing line and lures. Oklahoma City firefighters pried open the door to the car and muddy debris flowed out. A medical examiner literally dug inside of the mud of the car and found human remains. Investigators also found a diamond ring, a watch, and some credit cards. The road around the lake had changed a lot over the years, but it was determined that Marjorie failed to negotiate a curve and rode into the pond. Investigators also found a couple of bottles of alcohol that were open. However, it was impossible to determine if she was intoxicated or not. The bottles may have been something that she picked up at the store that night. And over time, maybe the bottles changed temperatures so much that they opened on their own. The discovery of the remains and car came as both a shock and a relief to Mr. Elston. At the time, he was vacationing in Mexico with his current wife of 20 years. His stepdaughter was present when the car was pulled out of the water and called him with the news. He stated that he had been worried for 27 years and he could now put it to rest with no more wondering. He was also hopeful that the people would stop blaming him for the murders. It's unclear what happened to the remains of Marjorie and Melinda, but they were both given to Mr. Elston's stepdaughter. There was a memorial service for them both, but Mr. Elston did not attend. It all happened while he and his wife Mary Jane were vacationing out of the country in Mexico. 
At the time, Mary Jane's health was declining, and Mr. Elston wanted to spend as much time as possible with her. Mary Jane passed away in the same year that the car was discovered, on October 24, 1990. She was buried in Memorial Park Cemetery in Oklahoma City. Mr. Elston remarried to a Margaret Alice Kripe in 1995. They were living in California when Robert died on August 25, 2002. He was transported back to Oklahoma City and buried next to his wife Mary Jane in Memorial Park Cemetery. Margaret died just two years later on August 28, 2004. She is buried in Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Orange County, California. Beside her is the name of Gentry Elston, which is a cenotaph for Robert. The mysterious case of the Elston disappearance is one of the strangest and longest standing cases in War Acres and Oklahoma City history. It took 27 years to solve the case, and thankfully some road construction helped solve it. This case would have been much bigger and national news if it wasn't for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I want to thank you all for joining me today as we took a closer look at this case and remembered some of the forgotten people and some of the forgotten events here in Oklahoma City. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.